Recognize their efforts in reducing and preventing violence and ultimately saving lives. God bless you. The event is a culmination of a week of activities host by the Office of Gun Violence Prevention for Community Violence Awareness Week. Community violence intervention programs are a key piece of the President's Safer America plan and have been shown to reduce violence by as much as 50%. That's why the Biden-Harris administration continues to make major investments in community violence intervention and other proven solutions to end the epidemic of gun violence. The President's American Rescue Plan provided over $15 billion to prevent crime and promote public safety, while the Bipartisan Safer Community Act provides $250 million in funding for community-based violence prevention initiatives. These actions are reducing crime and saving lives nationwide, with homicides and gun violence rates on the decline in 2023. We will continue to work to protect American communities from this senseless violence while calling on Congress to do its job and take further action to implement common sense gun safety measures. And finally, I also want to share a brief readout from uh, a recent visit by, by senior U.S. officials to Guyana, Colombia, and also Mexico. Principal Deputy National Security Advisor John Feiner traveled to Guyana and Colombia February 4th and 5th, which followed a series of other high-level U.S. visits. In Guyana, he met with President Ali and Caribbean Community CARICOM Secretary General Dr. Carla Barnett to reaffirm U.S. support to Guyana's sovereignty to advance economic and security cooperation and to discuss CARICOM's priorities for their February 25th meeting. Haiti and Venezuela figured uh, prominently in these discussions, as did Guyana's priorities on the United Nations Security Council. In Colombia, we issued a joint statement following Mr. Feiner's meeting with President Gustavo Petro that, that covered financing for sustainable infrastructure under President Biden's America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity Initiative, as well as ongoing cooperation on security and migration. The statement reaffirmed support for competitive and inclusive elections in Venezuela and implementation of the Barbados Agreement between representatives of Nicolas Maduro and the Uni Unitaria Platform. Mr. Feiner expressed appreciation for Colombia's continued effort to promote dialogue, but also underscored the need for the international community to support an electoral process free of harassment and intimidation where all candidates are eligible to run for office. Turning to Mexico uh, for a second, White House Homeland Security Advisor Dr. Sherwood Randolph Randall led an interagency delegation to Mexico February 6th and, the, and 7th. She engaged in a wide-ranging discussion with President, uh, uh, President AMLO, and then separately our delegation met with Mex Mexico's security cabinet, both focused on bilateral and regional issues, including sustained cooperation on migration and joint efforts to promote economic opportunity and development in the Americas. During the fourth meeting of the Trilateral Fentanyl Committee established by President Biden, uh, President AMLO, and uh, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, the United States, Mexico, and Canada agreed to a 10 joint actions to counter the trafficking of illicit synthetic drugs, including fentanyl and firearms in North America. These are, continue, these are outlined in our joint statement that was issued yesterday. On February 7th, Treasury des designated one of, the, one of Ecuador's most violent gangs and its leader for fueling the recent surge of violence in Ecuador. The sanctions are just one part of the significant assistance we are providing to our Ecuadorian partners as they confront transnational organized crime and illicit narcotics. Finally, allow me to once again, pay respect for the people of Chile as they mourn the loss of former President Sebastian Pinera. Our prayers also go out to, the, to all in Chile who lost loved ones to the wildfires and forced thousands to leave their homes. The United States is supporting firefighters by deploying technical staff, by providing satellite imagery, and offering funds to the purchasing, uh, fire, to purchasing firefighting equipment, and we stand ready uh, to do more. With that, thank you for your patience. I will turn things over to uh, my colleague, uh, Ian Sams, from uh, the White House Counsel's Office. Ian. Thank you, Kareem. Good to see everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Sure, thanks. Um, I want to start by talking about a few things that I think are important for you all to hear uh, and for the American people to hear. 
The president spoke powerfully about this last night. After a long investigation that turned over every stone and explored every theory, the special counsel decided that there was no case there. Notably, he said this would be true whether President Biden was president or a private citizen. The special counsel's assignment when he was appointed was to determine whether any criminal conduct occurred. He found it didn't. That was the finding. The case is closed. I want to read you something from none other than Ken Starr, who most people in this room will remember is the independent counsel who investigated former President Clinton. After that investigation, here's what he said to Congress, quote, what I see the conclusion as being is just a determination that no criminal charges would be brought, period, full stop. That is it. It's all over at that stage, end quote. That rings true here. The special counsel report goes on at length about the president's unprecedented cooperation in this case. I want to share a few things about that because I think it's very important. One, when the classified documents were found, it was self-reported. The president directed his team to ensure that any classified documents were returned immediately. Why did he do that? Because the president takes classified information seriously. He always has. He did not intentionally take classified documents. He understands documents like that belong with the government. He never, never made any attempt to obstruct. Two, he took unprecedented action to get the special counsel what he needed. He opened up every room in his family home and his beach house for comprehensive FBI searches, a first time in history. He sat for two days of interviews, an interview that I'll add, and the president talked about this last night, took place the day after the brutal attack on Israel. The president was managing an intensive international crisis. You just heard the vice president talk about this. He answered dozens of follow-up questions to the special counsel in writing. Three, he didn't exert executive privilege over any contents of the report. He was transparent. He had nothing to hide. There was a long, intensive, and in many ways, yes, excessive investigation. But for context, you should all remind, remember, in the case of former Vice President Mike Pence, who had a very, very similar incident occur right after President Biden, the case was closed within a few months. It was a brief one-page letter to Mike Pence. But in this case, there was a 15-month investigation. The special counsel interviewed 150 witnesses. He saw and obtained 7 million pages of documents down to emails about moving trucks during the transition in 2016 and 2017. He spent more than three and a half million taxpayer dollars exploring every possible theory that he could. And what was the result? He reached the inevitable conclusion based on the facts and the evidence that there was no case here. And this is important to think about in context of how this report is being viewed and by many of you being covered. This is the first special counsel investigation ever that hasn't indicted anyone. Every theory was explored, but the facts and the evidence disputed them. The decision was that there was no case to be made. In that reality, we also need to talk about the environment that we are in. For the past few years, Republicans in Congress and elsewhere have been attacking prosecutors who aren't doing what Republicans want politically. They have made up claims of a two-tiered system of justice between Republicans and Democrats. They have denigrated the rule of law for political purposes. That reality creates a ton of pressure. And in that pressurized political environment, when the inevitable conclusion is that the facts and the evidence don't support any charges, you're left to wonder why this report spends time making gratuitous and inappropriate criticisms of the president. Over the past 24 hours, we've actually seen legal experts and former prosecutors come out and give their analysis. Former Attorney General Eric Holder said the report, quote, contains way too many gratuitous remarks and is flatly inconsistent with long-standing DOJ traditions. The former acting FBI director said he had overseen many cases like this and, quote, you have, you have to have explicit evidence of willful retention of these documents, and that is just not present in this case. The former FBI general counsel, who I'll add is also, was also the lead prosecutor 
in the special counsel Mueller investigation said it was, quote, exactly what you're not supposed to do, which is putting your thumb on the scale that could have political repercussions. That's the assessment of seasoned professional law enforcement officials and prosecutors with deep experience at the Department of Justice. Unfortunately, the gratuitous remarks that the former attorney general talked about have naturally caught headlines in all of your attention. They're wrong and they're inaccurate and they obscure a very simple truth that I wanna repeat one last time, since I know it's hard to wade through 400 full pages. One, the report lays out example after example of how the president did not willfully take classified documents. The report lays out how the president did not share classified documents with anyone. The report lays out how the president did not knowingly share classified information with anyone. On page two, which I know you all read, the report argues that president willfully retained materials, but buried way later on page 215, the report says, and I quote, there is in fact a shortage of evidence on these points. 200 pages later. Put simply, this case is closed because the facts and the evidence don't support the theories here. The gratuitous comments that respected experts are saying is out of line are inappropriate. And they shouldn't distract from the fact that the case is closed and the facts and evidence show that they reached the right conclusion. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, just a couple of housekeeping. Uh, when and whom um, the, was the president briefed about on the contents of the report? The president was briefed by his lawyers. Um, and second, um, the president, um, and as you mentioned again, you thought some of, the, some of the characterizations were gratuitous. Does the president um, still have confidence in Merrick Carlin after selecting her uh, to be put in this position? Uh, if the president spoke to this last night, I think, I can't remember which of you asked uh, him what his thoughts were on the appointment of the special counsel, and he answered that, I think, thoughtfully and powerfully, and I don't really have anything to add beyond what the president said. Finally, does the president support the release of the entire transcript of his interview uh, to put to rest uh, some of these things that you think are being overlooked? Yeah, it's a reasonable question. I think that uh, it's important to know that we're dealing with classified materials in this conversation. There are classification issues there. I don't have any announcement on, you know, releasing anything today, but it's a, it's a reasonable question, and there are classified stuff, and we'll have to work through all that. So, but once you can work through, like, say, a redacted version, would the president uh, support uh, the release as long as you can obviously keep what needs to be kept secret secret? Well, we'll take a look at that and, and make a determination. Thanks, Ian. Um, two questions. First, uh, you said in the top that the president takes classified information seriously, and the president said last night that he never discussed classified material with anyone, but the special counsel's report said that on three different occasions he did discuss it with this ghostwriter. I, I understand it didn't meet the bar for prosecution, but how do you reconcile the president's statement with what's in the report? Sure. Well, if you read the full report, it actually gets into each of those three instances. I think Justin rightly points out that we're talking about three instances out of 200 and you know, 50 pages of evidence that they're talking about uh, criticizing. Um, I think it's important to look at those three examples. Two of them are his own notes to himself in his personal diary that he was reading about to his ghostwriter for his memoir, for a memoir about uh, his life after his son Bo died. And he was reading these passages that he had written to himself to share information with him. And he took pains, and the report lays this out to express how sensitive some of the information was and that we should be careful with it. And of those two passages from his diaries that he talked about with his ghostwriter, weren't in the book. There's no classified information in the book. And so, and so I wanna just make that point. And the second is there's a kind of an allegation of uh, you know, willfully taking a, a classified document that he talked about uh, with his ghostwriter, that's false. As the president talked about last night, he was again talking about a handwritten letter that he had sent to President Obama and faxed to him about the Afghanistan troop surge. Like, these, are, these are the president's own personal writings, you know, the president's own diary notes to himself. And I think there's an important thing to think about here. There's plenty of histor historical analogs, uh, the most notable of which is Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, whose diaries very famously uh, became a subject of a lot of attention in the country. Uh, and the Justice Department knew that President Reagan's diaries had classified information in them. Knew it at the time. He took those diaries home. He read those diaries to people. He shared the actual physical copy of the, of the, of the diaries, which uh, the special counsel report talks about 
Joe Biden never even gave custody of his notebooks to anybody. And, uh, and, and they never even asked for those diaries back, and they never launched an investigation. And why is that? It's because historically, going back to the beginning of the country, presidents keep diaries. They, we, we should want our presidents to be thoughtful and deliberative about the decisions that they make on the most consequential issues of our time. And we have, we have entrusted presidents to be safe keepers of this information. And, to, and we have expressed you know, great gratitude, uh, including many of you in the press, when, when presidents share through books and other things insights into their thinking and decision making and historical context. And so I think it's lost in the shuffle of all of this that the president did what all of his predecessors had done, which was take notes for himself, keep a diary of his own daily life so that he could think back on these big moments of, of the time. And so, you know, those are, that's important to know about this allegation that there was, that there was sharing the classified Right, is your contention that just because the president rewrote classified material in his own words and then shared it with somebody who didn't have the security clearance for it, that it was okay? Well, let's look at the report. I mean, we talked a little lot about the report. I understand it's long, 400 pages. I, you know, I'm not sure how many people in this room have read the entire thing. Page three, which I think is what everybody's asking about and understandably says, quote, Mr. Biden shared information, including some classified information with his ghostwriter, right? But if you go to page 248, the report says, quote, we conclude that the evidence does not establish that Mr. Biden willfully disclosed national defense information to his writing assistant. That's in the report. That's the conclusion that was made based on the evidence. And, and I, there's something else I want to add about this because it's gone, we've gone back and forth. On page one of the report, it says the president willfully retained classified marked documents relating to Afghanistan. But on page 215 of the report, it says, quote, there's in fact a shortage of evidence on these points. On page five of the report, everybody read that, first few pages, says, quote, Mr. Biden's memory was significantly limited. But here's something that everybody should make sure that they see. Elsewhere in the report, he says, quote, we expect the evidence of Mr. Biden's state of mind to be compelling, pointing to him providing, quote, clear and forceful testimony. That's his comments on his state of mind later in the report. And so I think it's important to kind of take the report in its totality and understand that in that report, the facts and evidence refute the theories that are floated that they explored. I think maybe we disagree on if he should have used the word will play last time, but there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is that his attorneys said that they were going to work on a process to make sure that none of this happens again. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there's the potential that this administration has less than a year left, so I'm wondering if you could detail uh, <laughs> uh, what the timeline is on that what you guys are considering for, uh, for that type of process. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that something that this uh, issue a year ago brought to light is uh, that this is a, unfortunately, very common occurrence uh, in our country. The National Archives has talked about how 80 different libraries and collections just in the last um, decade or so have called and said, oh, we found classified documents in these papers. And they have a process that you're supposed to turn those back in. But then, you know, we had the issue with President Biden. Immediately after that, we had the issue with Vice President Pence. And I think it's important to understand that this is a common occurrence, and the president thinks that we should fix it. Like, he gave all these documents back. He knew he did not, that these governments should be in possession, that the government should be in possession of these documents. And so what we're gonna do is the president's gonna appoint a task force to review how transitions look at classified material to ensure that there are better processes in place so that when, you know, staffs around the building are rushedly packing up boxes to try to get out during a transition as quickly as possible at the same time and up until the very moment that, you know, they're still governing and doing matters of state, you know, they're going to try to make recommendations that that can be fixed and he's going to appoint a senior government leader to do that. We'll have more on that soon. 2017 that he had classified material downstairs. He boasted about it. In your advocacy here and in the president's counsel writing back to uh, Mr. Herr, you're saying that there were gratuitous comments, that there are false pieces of information. How is the American public supposed to process this when we also live in a world where former President Trump asserts that there was a politicized process that resulted in his prosecution related to classified documents and other things? So for the public, if Democrats and this administration say, trust the Department of Justice, trust the institutions, but you're also arguing here, 
gratuitous political cheap shots and false assertions. How are they to process? Well, I talked about this actually a minute ago, and I think, you know, when you have the former attorney general, when you have the former acting FBI director, when you have the former general counsel of the FBI, you know, these are experienced people at the Justice Department who spent decades working at the Justice Department, and they're saying it's gratuitous. They're saying that this is inappropriate, that this is inconsistent with DOJ policy and practice. That's them saying it. We agree. You know, you heard the president speak forcefully about this last night. You heard the vice president speak forcefully about this today. We certainly agree that it's gratuitous. But I explained this a little bit in the opening. You know, we're in a very pressurized political environment. And when you are the first special counsel in history not to indict anybody, there is pressure to criticize and to make, you know, statements that maybe in otherwise you wouldn't make. And, you know, I, I think that it leaves you wondering why some of these critiques are in there. But I think it's also important to just fundamentally distinguish between the, the prior case that you mentioned. I want to be careful in terms of commenting on that. But the special counsel report goes into great detail about the differences and distinctions there. And I think it's important to understand that the criticisms that you're hearing of the gratuitous comments in the report, which are wrong, frankly, um, you know, this is being shared by people who have deep experience at the Justice Department. On the many issues related to memory that certainly seem to prompt an angry response from the president and from his advocates, is there anything being done to address that issue uh, in an ongoing way? Obviously, counsel wrote asking for some of those things to be removed. It is potential that Robert Hur could be called before Congress to testify in public. Are there any steps that the administration would take addressing that specific issue? Is it in relation to overall medical uh, physician's report of the president or other things to demonstrate what is the issue with memory and is it a factor that deals with his capacity uh, to serve? Well, I have a lot of issues with the contents of that question and Green's answered a lot about the president's transparency in his medical records and his uh, physical and things of that nature. Uh, and I, you know, leave that to, to, to Corrine to handle. But I, I'll say, I just read you this, page 248, or sorry, excuse me, uh, later in the report, he says, quote, we expect the evidence of Mr. Biden's state of mind to be compelling, pointing to him providing, quote, clear and, quote, forceful testimony. I can't explain why the report veers all over the place on this issue. I can just say, and as you've heard from the vice president, you heard from members of Congress yesterday talking about their recent interactions with the president. One, Congressman Goldman from New York, talking about his interaction with the president the day before this interview when Congressman Goldman was on the ground in Israel and the long and intensive and detailed conversation they had about what was going on on the ground. We just reject that this is true. And, and I think that, I think that it, it does raise questions about the gratuitousness and it raises, you know, makes you wonder why that's in there. Thank you, Karine, and thank you, Ian. So you are discrediting some of the findings in this report. You are discrediting some of the observations of President Biden. So why should the American public accept the conclusion that charges weren't warranted? I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're asking. I'm saying you're claiming that much of the report is inaccurate. So why are you so confident that the conclusion is correct? It's the conclusion like has been beginning. obvious from the very beginning. It was a long, intensive, sort of meandering investigation that came to the conclusion that in February of last year, everybody knew that this wasn't intentional, that this was an accident, that they were found, and as soon as they were found, the president said, give them back, get them back as soon as we can and fully cooperate with everything. So he reached the inevitable conclusion because it's the truth. The conduct of the investigation throughout and the gratuitous comments in the report are troubling and they're inappropriate. But I think that the, the finding was the obvious one because it's the truth. President Biden blamed his staff largely for the mishandling of documents and where they ultimately ended up. Does the president believe he did everything right when it comes to handling classified material? Well, just look at the, again, look at the report. I know it's long, but the report talks about how the evidence is that these were most likely things that were packed up by staff during movements and transitions and things of that nature. So that's reflected by the report. It's not some accusation by the president. It's just true. I mean, you guys know, you guys work with White House staff all the time. We support the principal. That's our job. And principal relies on their staff to help them with things. And the president said this last night. You know, he talked about how, you know, looking back, if he had been more he, he wishes you more engaged in that process of the packing and the moving things to make sure that things were being done the right way. And I think the most important thing to remember is once it was realized that something wrong had happened, 
He did everything right to get it back and to fix the problem. What about all the stuff that he talked about that was in his home, in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked in his house? What stuff was he talking about? Classified materials? Well, we talked about, I mean, the report goes on at length about this. I'd encourage you to, to read it. It well, talks I about- about what he said last <laughs> night. He said the stuff in my house was all in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. Didn't he put them in his home? I'm, I'm not really following the question. I think that what's clear is that, and I told this to Justin a minute ago, you know, he has personal diaries that he had. Of course he has his personal diaries. The documents that were taken were jumbled up in boxes and found inadvertently in places, and, and that's, that's what happened, so. We, we gotta move on. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how concerned is the president and, and the team here that the, quote, gratuitous comments are going to damage him, damage public perception of him? I think the public is smart, and I think that they can see uh, what's going on. I think that they see a president who fully cooperated. I think they see a president who did the right thing and made sure everything got back. Uh, and I think that they see that this was a long investigation that ended without a case to be made. And you know, I think that they can see and understand uh, you know, when people are gratuitous and, and make comments that they shouldn't make and that are beyond the, the, the remit of a prosecutor to do. Um, I think that they understand that, and I think that they, I think that they'll, they'll understand that the president did the right thing here. If the seventh and eighth were obviously, or eighth and ninth were obviously like very busy days where the president was overstretched, taking calls in the middle of the night, all of this, why continue with the interview with her? Why not do it on another day? Uh, why give him the opportunity to have these lines in the report about lapses, about timelines? That he should have thrown up roadblocks. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I, no. I'm he, he, he committed to it, and as and like, hey, the world is on fire. Could we do it another I'll, day? I'll tell you what's interesting about this, and this is um, oddly not in the report. Is at the beginning of uh, his interview, the special counsel told the president, "I understand that you know you're dealing with a lot of things right now, and I'm going to be asking you questions about stuff from a long time ago. I want you to try to recall to the best of your abilities." you know, things of that nature. That's often what prosecutors would tell witnesses. Uh, so, you know, he understood that, but the president was gonna commit to being cooperative. He talked about this last night. He wanted to make sure he had everything he needed and he didn't wanna throw up roadblocks. We gotta move on, good Thanks, um, Just a first question, has the president read the entire report and when was he given the, the report? Did, did he review it when his lawyers did the privilege review? Um, and do you have any just context on when he himself found the, the findings of it? Uh, we received the report yesterday uh, from the Justice Department and formally like present, you know, sending it over. Um, obviously the president's lawyers were, were doing the privilege review that we disclosed to everybody was happening and disclosed when we had concluded it. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, uh, they were, you know, they, they had briefed him on, uh, on, the, on the material as the client, you know, as is typical in a, in a legal case. Um, and then we received the full report yesterday. You know, the president's been pretty busy. I'm not sure he's read 400 pages. I'm not sure how many, you know, folks in this room have read all 400 pages of it, but he certainly is familiar with the contents of the report. Just one quick follow-up. The president was animated last night, uh, rejecting the idea that he did not remember when his son died. Can you provide a little bit more context about, was he directly asked in the interview by the special counsel for the dates? Was it part of a broader conversation? I just think some additional context to understand what is in that report um, might be helpful. Yeah, I think, I mean, the president was pretty clear last night, and I think that the American people have heard from him for years about the pain and the suffering that they went through when Bo passed away um, and the gravity of that. And I think to suggest that he couldn't remember when his son died is really out of bounds. Um, you know, the conversations in the, in the interview back and forth, you know, he's being asked about, you know, file folders from a basement and how did they get there and what is that and what were you doing around that time and things of that nature. I don't want to, but just to be very careful, I don't want to get into specific you know, things while it's still in a classification process. But, you know, it is safe to say that of course the president knows when his son died. So do you have any sense of why the special counsel would write explicitly in the report that the president did not, was unable to recall when his son died? Uh, you'd have to ask the special counsel why he chose to include that. Thanks, Corrine. Thanks, Ian. So you said that you told the special counsel that the criticisms of President Biden were inaccurate, gratuitous, and wrong. So how did the special counsel respond when you told them that? I put out his report. 
so they ignore it. I, I, I'm unaware of any uh, uh, changes that were made in response to our very strong, forceful, and rooted in evidence arguments that we provided. And you had just mentioned how these interviews happened <clears throat> shortly after the October 7th attacks. The president mentioned it last night. <clears throat> in mentioning that, does that mean that possible memory lapses happened because he was so distracted by what was happening overseas? Or do you dispute that he had any memory issues during those hours of interviews? I, I dispute that the characterizations about his memory that were in the report are accurate because they're not. Um, and I think the president spoke very clearly about how he, his mind was on other things. I mean, he, he was dealing with a huge international crisis of great global consequence. And you know he was trying his best to, to answer questions in this interview because he wanted to be fully cooperative. So there were no memory lapses during? I, I, think, you know, I think there's something important that people should remember about the way that sort of interviews like this happen. I, God forbid you know, one of you guys ever have to get interviewed by a prosecutor, and you know, I hope you don't. Uh, uh, you know, witnesses are told, as I mentioned by special counsel, to do the best they can to recall or remember things. And they're, they're not supposed to speculate. You know, they want facts. They want facts and evidence. And so, you know, I think probably in almost every uh, prosecutorial interview you can imagine that people have uh, said that they don't recall things because that's what they're instructed to do. So I think that's just important context to keep in mind. And just lastly, in September, the president was asked about Trump's classified documents being found in Mar-a-Lago. And he said, quote, how could that possibly happen? How could anyone be that irresponsible? But there were classified documents found in the president's garage in a damaged cardboard box. So would that be considered irresponsible? Uh, look, I think the president made clear that he gave everything back as soon as he found out that he had it. And so you know, I think that it's fundamentally incorrect to try to analogize the situation. or to tr and, the, and frankly, the report says that, too. And the idea that, um, that he did anything except be totally cooperative and to take great strides to ensure that the classified documents were returned speaks for itself. Thank you. Um, Ian, the Vice President referred today to the report as being politically motivated. Is that the position of the White House, that this report was politically motivated? Well, I, I saw the Vice President's remarks. I thought they were very powerful. And I talked about this a little bit at the top of our conversation here today. You know, There's an environment that we are in that generates uh, a ton of pressure because you have congressional Republicans, other Republicans, attacking prosecutors that they don't like. And it creates you know, a, a need. If you're going to determine that charges weren't filed, people are human. And they're thinking through, you know, what do we need to do? And um, uh, you know, it leaves one to wonder exactly why he included a lot of the criticisms that were in there. Also, on, with regard to the staff, <laughs> President Biden has had some staff members who've worked for him for decades. Uh, he referenced their mistake last night. Has he had a visit with any of these staff members? Do the staff members who are responsible for taking those documents to his house, do they still work for the president? Have there been any consequences? Well, I think I talked about this also before. I mean, this is an issue that has plagued administrations of both parties for 50 years, where accidentally things get shuffled up and taken and removed. And the archives has, you know, literally they put a frequently asked questions page on their website about what you do if you find them accidentally. That's how often it happens. And, you know, he gave them all back as soon as he found out about it. We understand that mistakes happen sometimes. I'm not going to get into sort of individual witness or parsing like that from the it report. Didn't for President Obama, President Clinton, President Bush Sr., or President Bush Jr. I don't know if three people makes it a common. That, that's actually not true. Officials from all administrations from the past, you know, half century or so have had this accidentally happen. But you're, you're parsing two things. You asked me about the fact that, and the report states this clearly, that this was likely a result of inadvertent packing by staff. And uh, you asked exactly about the staff issue, and so I'm responding about the staff issue. Okay. And you can't say whether the staff still works for President Biden? Well, I'm saying that, that the, the, the question you're asking about uh, the frequency and normalcy, unfortunately, of mistakes like these being made, they happen. And what, what matters is how you respond to it. And when you find out that there was a mistake that was made, you give everything back. And that's exactly what was done. Right, I'm trying to get as much people as possible to answer. Sure. Thanks, Ian. Um, what, does yeah. it, what does it say about Merrick Carlin's judgment that he appointed someone who ultimately put out a report that was so egregious, so inappropriate, and flouted department regulations and norms? I think the President actually answered this question last night. I'm not sure which of you asked him it, but he talked about you know, his views on the appointment of the special prosecutor, and I really don't have anything beyond what he said.
Two things I was hoping you could uh, quickly clarify. The report says that in 2017, the president told his ghostwriter that he just found all the classified stuff downstairs. Why did he not report that at the time? Well, and this is included in the report as well, if you read through it. Um, the president was talking about a handwritten letter that he had uh, sent to President Obama that he faxed to him about the Afghanistan uh, uh, policy in 2009. And, um, you know, he says, in, you know, and this is in the report that he just, and he said last night, you know, I should, have I should have said sensitive. I should have said, you know, really careful, you know, more careful language about that because he was talking about something that was a personal, like a letter he sent to the president. So in his mind, it was sensitive, but what he said was classified. Yeah, this is in the report. They talk a lot about how, um, you know, the president actually took great care when talking with his book writer to note things like, hey, I, you need to be really careful with some of this stuff. I'm not entirely sure about it. And so I think that I think that that's important to realize that the report itself actually talks about what care he took with this sort of information as they explore all the theories and go through all the evidence that sort of refutes most of those theories, almost all of actually all of those theories when you think about the judgment that there will be no case in this in this matter. So, you know, that's that's addressed in the report. Second thing, um, the president also said last night, all the stuff that was in my home was in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. But the report uh, says that some of the classified documents were in cabinet drawers, uh, while others about Afghanistan, for example, were in unsealed and badly damaged box sitting in his garage. So did the president misspeak last night? Look, I think the president was responding to a number of inaccurate uh, allegations in this uh, in this report. Um, we've talked a lot about, uh, Justin asked about the diaries. I mean, this is his personal diaries. Of course, he has them in his house. Um, so, you know, I don't have anything kind of to add on what he said last night. Um, I want to follow up on the vice president's comments on, you've been saying gratuitous. She said politically motivated. Is it this, is it this administration's stance that this report was issued in part, or there was a motive in this issue, a goal, a goal with this report to inflict political harm on the president? I think that you have to look at what, I mean, we talked about this at the beginning of our conversation today. You, know, you have a situation where former DOJ officials are talking about the political repercussions of these actions, and that it's incumbent upon the prosecutor to take great care to follow departmental policy, to not criticize unindicted conduct and behavior, or characteristics, which we've seen in, in this that's, case. That's and former GOJ officials. But this White House right now, is it the stance by this White House that this report was issued in part with a motive and a goal to inflict political harm on the president? I, I, I heard the question the first time, and I'm just, I'm, I, I you know, have nothing to object to in what the vice president said. I thought she was powerful and forceful. But, but also, just to follow up, I'm sorry, this administration, as you said, you said that Republicans have often attacked prosecutors, yeah. independent that's systems, well and you said that's created an environment where, if I've interpreted this right, there is an incentive by the special counsel to include some of this language. But often I've heard from Democrats and this White House say that those attacks against independent systems can also sow distrust with the public and those independent institutions. By saying that this is politically motivated, not just gratuitous, but politically motivated, does this not also sow distrust with the public? I, I reject that. I, I reject that question. You see this, and it's in the report, the letter that the, the president's lawyer and the White House counsel's office sent to the special counsel to talk about the Department of Justice norms and policies that they see as being violated by some of the comments and remarks made in the report. And so, you know, I think that that's a false equivalence kind of question, uh, because what we have argued and what we continue to say and believe is that you're not supposed to make these sorts of things according to Justice Department policy. We, the president, when he ran, and you guys all know this because you heard this, talked about how important it was to restore the rule of law. And he understands that. And he talked about this last night, to MJ's point, about the appointment of the special counsel and sort of how he felt about that. Um, you know. This is a president who is committed to, the, to restoring those norms. And I think when we object to some of the gratuitousness in the comments that you're asking about, you know, we're, and you hear me talk about the former attorney general and other people who've made those comments, you know, they are criticizing that this does not follow those norms. Do you think it was political Yeah, I know. We got to keep going. With respect to the portion of the video in the transcript where he was asked about his time as vice president and about Bo Biden's death, why not release those parts of the video? Those aren't classified. 
it's a transcript we're talking about, and I already addressed this uh, with Justin. Okay, so 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 what you're saying is this wasn't a, a video? There was there's not tapes that you can release of that. I was just responding. I, I think that the question is about the transcript. Okay, and, and as far as attorney, former Attorney General Holder is concerned, you referenced him and the normal <clears throat> DOJ review process. He brought that up in his tweet as well, or his ex posting. What part of the normal DOJ review process is the White House saying was violated or bypassed in some way? Well, there's actually. It's an interesting question. It's a little in the weeds, pardon me, but this, the, the special counsel regulations that exist at the Justice Department govern the process that is supposed to happen here, and the Justice Department has its own sort of manual of procedures. And you know, as you've heard from those experts, you're not supposed to sort of criticize unindicted conduct when you're making these determinations. Okay, Phil in the back. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up and then a separate question. You said a moment ago that the president was responding to inaccurate information mm -hmm. when he claimed uh, last night that all the stuff in my home was behind locked filing cabinets. Is he entirely clear now, at this point, where all the documents were discovered? And does he now know that his statement about locked filing cabinets is false? The, the report lays out in 400 pages of detail all of the evidence and all of the review that they conducted in looking into this matter. Uh, the president made sure that all of the classified documents that were found were returned promptly to the government, which is what you're supposed to do, which is why this is the inevitable conclusion that there is no case here. And that's not what I asked, though. Does he know that his statement yesterday that all the documents were behind locked cabinets yeah. was inaccurate? Is he clear in his mind? I know that last night was perhaps, you know, stressful, confusing environment, but does he I, I understand what you're trying to ask, Phil, and I think that I've answered I, the I, question. I, so I have a separate follow-up right, question, and that is my follow-up question Thank after you. that lack of a response was there was an eye-popping moment in the report specifically about the, the president's ghostwriter, and that was that after he learned that the special counsel had began an investigation, he deleted some of his recordings. Now, those recordings were able to be recovered. What I'm curious about is can you say um, definitively whether or not the president or anyone else at the White House was in contact with his ghostwriter. Um, this is in the report. I mean, read the report. In the report it says that, that they sought this, they looked into this, and that, that they didn't. So, so they that's in the report. John, they were not in contact. Thank John. you, Kareem. Uh, Ian, thank you so sure. much. Yeah. And two questions. Just for clarity, you're from the White House Counsel's Office, correct? correct? But you're not a lawyer, correct? That's correct. Okay. I'm a spokesperson. Okay. Uh, any chance that we'll get the White House counsel to come out here and answer questions uh, directly? Yeah, I, should I be offended by that? I mean, I, 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 I was. I get offended I was, all the time. I know. I mean, what? I mean, come on. You did say something that was factually I was, incorrect. I would ask, I, 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 there has been a previous yeah, special yeah, counsel. John, John, John finish, but, finish your question, please. I, I was asked to come today by your colleagues in the press corps, and we happily obliged. Right. As you know, former President Trump. He was charged with a slew of criminal charges related to classified documents in his possession, including counts of willful retention mm -hmm. of national defense information. In this report, uh, it's made clear by the special counsel that President Biden willfully retained and disclosed <coughs> classified material. He kept it in unsecured locations after his vice presidency. Uh, which presented, according to the special counsel, serious risks to national security. So yeah, my question to you, Ian, is can you explain to every voter out there, every American, why it is that President Biden essentially is let off the hook and former President Trump is now facing these slew of criminal charges, which seem to most people very similar. Great windup, John. I mean, I mean, really a good windup. I talked about this uh, already. Page one, willful retention. Page two, 15. There is, in fact, a shortage of evidence on these points. The report itself goes through in great detail the facts and evidence that led to the obvious conclusion that there was no case here. The report itself answers the question you're asking about the distinction between two cases, as you guys have heard us from the White House say for a long time. We're very careful about commenting on certain cases like that. Just, I would encourage you, perhaps all of you, read the report. I've read the report, and that's the reason why I asked that question, and the reason why so many people seem confused, because you hear willful retention of national defense information related to Trump, willful retention of classified, classified material related to President Biden, and yet one individual is facing a criminal trial 
being brought by the Department of Justice in Fort Pierce, Florida, and the other one sure. is not facing is, any charges sure. whatsoever. Sure. And I think I've talked to many of, of you guys in the room over the last 24 hours about this. Uh, uh, the allegation that there was willful retention of documents is refuted by the evidence in the report. And the conclusion was made directly that the evidence does not support that claim. He explored the theory. It's in there on page two. Everybody focused on it. I'm exploring the theory of willful retention, but that the evidence as a whole was insufficient because that's not what the facts show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karine. Yeah. Really appreciate, appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. There Thanks, was yeah. a previous special counsel probe that did not result in indictments, by the way. The Ham Jordan case. Okay, thank you. I would say refer to the White House special counsel, and now, not special counsel, but legal counsel. They're here. They came. Okay, go ahead, Almer. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, two questions just following up on yeah. comments that the President made last night. Yeah. Um, President Biden called the military operations in Gaza mm -hmm. over the top. Um, and this comes after the White House has pretty consistently defended Israel's conduct. What's changed and what exactly did the president mean by over the top? Yeah, so first of all, I, I, you know, I would say nothing has changed. His position hasn't changed. His, I don't think his messaging has, has changed. Uh, we don't think his messaging has changed. He doesn't believe his messaging has changed. This isn't something uh, the first time he's done so, what you heard from him yesterday. Look, the president made it very clear uh, in his comment that he was obviously talking about uh, Israel's conduct in Gaza. Uh, and he's been clear. He's been clear that the United States uh, wants to see Hamas, a, a terrorist organization, defeated. He's been very clear on that. Uh, that is a shared goal that we have, obviously, with Israel. Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, while we have said that, we have been also very clear, the president has been very clear, that they must do so by ensuring that uh, their operations are targeted and conducted in a way that we are protecting innocent civilians. And that is something that we have been incredibly consistent uh, about here uh, in this administration. We want to make sure that we are also protecting innocent civilians. So that is what uh, the president was, uh, was uh, speaking to yesterday. Uh, he was asked, they obviously a direct question, and he answered that. Okay, just, uh, secondly, um, the president last night um, bristled against the fact that many Americans have concerns about his age. Um, I think uh, to a question of one of my colleagues, he said, that's your judgment, suggesting it's the media's judgment. Uh, there's no shortage of published polls that suggest Americans have concern about his age and stamina, and it's been put in all sorts of different ways. So is the president out of touch with what Americans feel about this issue? So, uh, you know, look, obviously when it comes to the report more broadly, you just heard from uh, my colleague um, Ian Sams, that part of the report we don't think lives in reality, and that's what he was speaking to, where, uh, uh, where you know, comments were made in that report about that, about uh, obviously about his memory that we don't believe uh, lives in reality. And no, 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 I'm going to answer your question. Just give me, just give me, just give me a beat. I'm going to answer your question. When you have a president that has been one of the most productive, if not the most productive and effective presidents in modern time, that you would assume is a president that is indeed in touch uh, with where the American people are, right? That would assume that the president understands what's going on around the kitchen table when Americans are sitting around the kitchen table trying to figure out how are they going to deal with the economy? How are they going to deal with the health care? So, in our opinion, in my opinion, he is very much in touch with what Americans are feeling out there uh, as it relates to lowering costs, as it relates to making sure that we big, beat big pharma. This isn't the president who understands <laughs> what the American people are feeling. Look, as it relates to his age, as it relates to uh, what has been said uh, by, you know, by uh, in this report, it is something that we don't believe lives in reality in the sense of this is a, this is a president I have spent, I've known this president since 2009. I've known this president. He's been not just my boss, but a mentor to me. And no one in this building would say that what we saw in this report about his memory. Everybody sees somebody who works very, very hard, has spent hours with him, understanding exactly where the American people are and what they're feeling, and also how to deliver uh, on those critical, important issues to them. Your argument on, his, on the report and uh, the assertion that it's gratuitous is well taken as well as yeah. what you believe is his performance. I get that. Yeah. But he seemed to be playing with a different set of facts. The facts are that this is an issue that 
Americans are concerned about. And he's saying that it's just the media's judgment. Right, but he's also joked around with all of you and talked about uh, and, and said some, some things ab uh, about his age in a way that he understands where people, uh, where, where people are. He actually said that when in his answer. He has also mentioned his old pal Jimmy Madison, right? He, he gets it. He gets how he's viewed. He gets what people see and what's written about him and what the American people also see. But there are other things to note. Right? McCarthy, when he was speaker, said uh, that he has found the president mentally sharp in meetings. You know, there are stories like that from, uh, as they're saying it quietly, privately, House Republicans and other Republicans in, co in Congress. But there's reports from all of you who have said that they have, to they have interviewed some of these folks and have said the president is sharp. The president, uh, when they have a conversation with the president, he understands the issue. I mean, we saw it at the la last State of the Union. He, you know, he was able to negotiate while giving a very important speech, about 90 minutes, to the world. Like, I mean, you know, millions of Americans watch as he was able to negotiate with House Republicans in the room. So, so people see that also, also for themselves. They also see that for themselves as well. So it's the president's feel that this is uh, the result of uh, Americans being concerned about his age is just based on a media narrative, and it's, it's not well, based in reality. What I'm saying is that he, hear, he understands what people may think. He's actually joked about it. He actually has joked about it, saying Jimmy Madison and has said many other things. He says, I know I'm not, I know I, people think I'm 40 years old. Like he's made jokes about it. So he gets it. What we are saying, what I am saying in front of you today is that he has results. There are results, his record. The data shows that this is a president that gets where the American people are and has delivered in that way, whether it's the economy, whether it's healthcare, even on the global stage what other leaders have said about him, right? What other, what he has been able to bring leaders together, more than 50 countries, to deal with an issue, not an issue, a war, be very clear, in Ukraine, where the brave people of Ukraine are fighting against Mr. Putin's aggression. So, world leaders see it, leaders on the other side of Pennsylvania, whether it's a Republican or Democrat, see it, and so that matters as well. And that's what we're trying to, to say to you as well. It is that we have seen and we have heard from others that this is a president that has delivered and this is a president that's going to continue to, to do so for the American people. Go ahead, uh, Thanks, Kareem. You've downplayed concerns about the president's memories in situations where he's mixed up certain things. You've said it happens and it's common. But yesterday we saw the president again have a mix up with the president of Egypt, with the president of Mexico. So. How do you explain that? Is it not valid that voters would have these concerns? Look, what I would say is this. Um, that this is a president that has, this has had relationship uh, with world leaders for more than 40 years. He has. Uh, and at times, and I even said this yesterday, does he, has, has he, um, you know, misspoken, as many of us do. I've laid out uh, some examples of even Speaker Johnson just on, uh, on TV, on Meet the Press on Sunday, who, who said he, su he supports Iran when he meant to say he supports Israel. It happens. It truly, truly happens. Uh, in that same answer uh, that he gave, he actually gave an incredibly detailed uh, answer on the overlapping dynamics in the Middle East as he was, as he was responding uh, to the question that he received from one of your colleagues. Uh, and look, uh, I, I want to quote one more, one more person as I've been quoting folks this, uh, today. Uh, Yara Rosenberg at the, the Atlantic said, Biden has gaff, gaff names his entire career, his entire career. It is not uncommon that he has done that, like many of us do. And he said he was, he was clearly, uh, and he was clearly uh, talking, uh, clearly talking about Egypt uh, and named Sisi and laid out his policy and the broader issues in detail. Twitter just isn't interested in that, right? And so look, this is a president who has the experience. He's been, you've heard me say this, he's been senator for 36 years. He's been obviously pre uh, vice president for eight and now president. He has these long, long uh, relationships with leaders. I think what's important here is to remember is that when it comes to the essence of the issue, the issue at hand, he understands that and has dealt with that probably, uh, you know, better than you know, any modern day president because of the record that we have seen, because of what has presented in front of him uh, as we look at what's going on in the world, uh, what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in the Middle East. How did the president react when he first saw the report? I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, private discussions, private <laughs> conversations with the, pre with the president. And just to follow up quickly, I think Justin had asked this before, but 
Ian Sams was making this argument that these are notes that he was reading from his own personal notes, from his own personal diary, but that can still be classified information even if it was stuff he had written to himself. So is the White House disputing that there was classified information there? That so look, I'm not going to get into, Ian spent a good couple of minutes going back and forth and answering that question. I'm just not, I don't have anything else beyond what Ian, uh, Ian my colleague, shared here. I think the bigger picture here is that uh, the closest, the, the, the case is closed, and I think that's what the American people also should know uh, as well, and so I'm just not going to get into details from here. Okay. Thanks, Green. Uh, with concerns about the president's age. Are there any um, plans within the White House to have him engage more with the press, engage more? Um, you know, there he decided not to do the interview before the Super Bowl that many presidents have done. Has there been any considerations about revisiting that or other sorts of engagements to, as you said, many people in the White House uh, do not see the, the image of him that the report depicts? Are there conversations about trying to um, change that perception among the American people? I mean, look, uh Look, you, you saw, you, your colleagues were, I think, were you in the room, Tyler, yesterday? Your colleagues were, and yourself, were able to see the president and ask questions uh, yesterday. Uh, he, was, he did that, I believe, if not the day before yesterday, he did that a couple of times uh, this week, I think about three times, engaging with the press. It's just something that uh, he does pretty often. Uh, you know, and we're going to try and, and obviously pick moments. Uh, he's going to, uh, on his own, have moments where he's going to want to walk over and talk to all of you, as he's done many times before. Uh, and he, we're going to continue, obviously, to your question, yes, we're going to find um, many different ways to engage with the press. That's something that we think is very important. Uh, it's important to take your questions. Uh, it's important to hear from all of you uh, and hear directly uh, to, uh, you know, what, uh, you know what's, uh, what's on the mind of the American people as well as what we we believe is on the mind of the American people and take questions. So that's not going to change. I don't have, uh, I don't have anything. Change, but I'm just wondering if there's been more conversation in the White House in the last 24 hours about in a sense of urgency to try I mean, to get the president. I, I hear the question, but he literally took questions from all of you three times this week. Three times. Once when we were on the broad. The press, but just more broadly about getting the president out, out more um, to try to combat the, the idea that he has memory issues as, or, and, and is it, no, but you know, I hear your question, but he, we literally did I was on the road with the president from Thursday last week until Monday evening. We went to Detroit or Michigan. We went to Michigan. We went to California. We went to uh, you know well, we went to Vegas. The president has been out there, uh, I, you know, and that's something that we're going to continue to do. Uh, and so he wants to be out there to talk directly to the American people. You hear us say that all the time. Uh, and you've seen him do that throughout the month of January. Uh, and now, obviously, we're in February. We're going to continue doing that as we have been for the last uh, two to three years. It's not going to stop. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kareem. A question about Israel. The, has he communicated <coughs> to Prime Minister Netanyahu that he believes his response has been over the top? Is that language he has used in their discussion? I mean, look, we have read out uh, well, every, you know, we've read out conversations that the president has had uh, with the prime minister. Uh, the president has always been clear uh, with, with, uh, with the prime minister. Um, I just don't have anything beyond that. Uh, you know, what he, you know, what he, he, has, he said yesterday, what the president said yesterday, he's done before uh, in saying very clearly, obviously, obviously we believe that Israel has a right to defend itself. Uh, obviously we believe we are in agreement uh, that, uh, you know, a terrorist organization, uh, we have to, they have to make sure that they uh, are, um, uh, deal with this terrorist organization that on talk October 7th, uh, you know, uh, terrorized, uh, terrorized and killed uh, more than, you know, 1,200 people. That is a reality. Uh, but at the same time, the president has also been clear that their military operations need to be done in a precise way, in a more targeted way. We need to protect civilians' lives. Uh, and so, you know, that has been the case. Now, in the broader scope, the president has been working with his team to make sure that we have another humanitarian pause. We understand how important that is uh, to make sure we bring those hostages home uh, to their friends, to their family, to their loved ones, and also get that really critical, important humanitarian aid that's needed uh, in Gaza, get that in there. And so that's, where, that's been the president's position. Nothing has changed there. Can you clarify whether there's been any change in White House policy with regard to tying aid for Israel to its actions? I don't have any change of policy to announce to you, to hold you. Okay. Um, since my colleague referenced a question that we asked last night, the question was about 
voters having concerns about the president's age, and his response was that that was my judgment. It was obviously mm -hmm. making a reference to public polls that are out there that indicate that voters do have this concern. So does the president not believe that many voters have this concern about his age? I mean, the president's talked about it. He's joked about his age. Right. He has. He has joked about his age, understanding uh, what uh, what voters might think. He has. He's done. He's done. He's done that pretty often. Uh, I think what he uh, I think the other thing that you that we want to make sure that you all understand is that this is a president that also has delivered for the American people. That is a fact. That is something that we see in the data. That is something that we see in the policy, whether it's a bipartisan uh, legislation that we've been able to get through, that people didn't think we would be able to get through, whether it's as, as it relates to like infrastructure or the, uh, the Chips and Science Act, real, real, real things that American people feel. And for him, that's what he believes is important to focus on, is what the American people need in the sense of issues that matter to them. And that's what he wants his focus to be. That's what we want our focus to be as well. That's what we're always trying to communicate with all of you. But he jokes about it all the time. He makes jokes about his age all the time. I'm just asking for clarification on why the fact that we brought up that concern prompted him to say, this is your judgment. As though there isn't because because what I that shows that voters do have that concern. well I just stated I just stated moments ago it is it is your judgment right in the sense of like that is not what we see right when we see what, it wasn't my judgment but meaning more broadly I'm not talking about you specifically yes, more broadly, I'm more broadly I'm just right. asking does the president believe and understand that that is a concern that voters I already have? said he understands that's why he makes jokes about it I get he understands that but what we are trying to say is our judgment from here, what we see from this president, is a president that is zeroed in and focused on the American people. When we see him working, he is focused. And we don't see what, for example, all of this was brought up by the report. We, we do not believe that part of the report lives in reality. And that is what we're speaking to. That is what we're talking about. Do you think there's any risk to the president sounding like he's dis dismissing that concern when he has that kind of reaction to a question like that? Look, the president is going to uh, obviously speak for himself and lay out what he thinks is important for the, to talk about uh, as it relates to the Amer American people. When, it when he wants to talk about the economy, he wants to talk about health care. We are talking this week about gun violence, right? How do we prevent gun violence, which is an issue uh, that is incredibly in important to communities across the country. When you, when you think about gun violence being an epidemic in this country, those are the things that he wants to focus on. Those are the things that he wants to, uh, that he wants to make sure that the American people understand what we're doing to deal with those critical issues. Uh, as it relates to his age, he makes jokes about it. He does. You hear him make jokes about it all the time. He gets it. He gets it. But he also wants to make sure that we are talking about the issues that, and I talked about this starting, almost starting this, um, the, the briefing here, is what people really care about when they are sitting around their kitchen table. And that matters. We believe that matters as well. Okay, Francesca. Thanks, Green. Picking up <coughs> on Tyler's line of questioning, why wasn't there a two and two today with the German chancellor? <clears throat> Look, we always find different ways uh, to, um, uh, to to uh, engage with the press when we do these uh, when we do these types of bilats, there are many things that come into consideration. Uh, and with this trip, there was no two plus two. You're going to see uh, obviously you're, there's going to be some of your colleagues going to be part of the um, of the uh, pool spray uh, in a couple of minutes, not too long from now. And so you you know you'll have an opportunity to see the two of them. Look, every visit is different. Uh, and they're di different for different reasons. It's not just us. We have uh, conversations with um, with other countries that uh, the leader, uh, obviously the leader of uh, the team of the uh, other country. I just this just happens to not have a two plus two, but that's not always the case. And yesterday, when you made light of the president's verbal flubs, had you been briefed on the special counsel report or no. or seen it at all? No, nope, not at all. And what do you mean when I made light of the president's verbal flubs? Well, you made some jokes in response to questions about the president confusing world leaders with deceased world leaders. And I, well, I, I, what I did was I, I tried to state very clearly that, uh, and yes, I did it in a light way because it does happen to many people. And I actually talked about one of your colleagues that I do it to all the time. Uh, and so, look, I, you know, I just want to be very clear. You know, this is a this is a president uh, that is very much focused on the American people, 
He is very much focused on making sure what he was elected to do gets done. Uh, what he has, with the promises that he's made to communities across the country, gets kept. So I just want to make sure that is made also very clear. And finally, in response to the special counsel report, one of the president's Republican presidential rivals, Nikki Haley, has called for a mental competency test for the president. Is that something that the White House is actively considering as a way to try and put to rest some of these allegations about his memory lapses? I, I mean, look. I'm not a medical doctor, so certainly I'm not going to stand here and make uh, opine on, on, on tests or anything in, of that nature. What I can say is that, and I remember talking uh, to, um, I remember talking to um, uh, the president's doctor last year when I was asked about a cognitive, te cognitive test when the president's, uh, when a president's uh, physical came out. And he said to me, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm paraphrasing because this was over a year ago at this point, uh, that because of the president's actions every day, what he deals with, with world leaders, uh, the domestic issues that, that he has to, has to deal with, uh, he believes that that shows, right? That shows that uh, the president is very much active and understands what's going on, right? And didn't believe that, uh, didn't believe that uh, a test like that was warranted because of just who he is as president of the United States and everything that he has to deal with. But again, I'm not a medical doctor. We, uh, the president's going to continue to be obviously transparent uh, when it comes to his physical. We were the last two years. Uh, we'll have one. He'll have one this year. And when we're, when we, the, the time permits, obviously, or when the time comes, uh, we'll certainly share that. Thank you, Kareem. Um, last night, soon after the president's remarks about Israel, the administration announced a national security memo that calls for the State Department to obtain written assurances that countries that receive weapons from the U.S. will use those weapons in accordance with the law of war. Jake Sullivan, Kirby, others have previously said that the U.S. already requires those assurances. So why did the administration um, feel the need to formalize that and ask for it in writing now? So look, uh, so this mem memorandum that you're speaking of, it emerged in part with our discussions with members of Congress. Uh, and uh, so this uh, obviously m memo came out yesterday. Uh, and so it's called the National Security Memorandum. It outlines the standards and con uh, that countries must ad adhere, as you just laid it, uh, you just laid out. But I also want to be clear, there are, new there are no new standards in this memo. Uh, we are not imposing new standards for military aid. That's not what is in this memo. Instead, we are spelling out publicly the existing standards uh, by the international law, including the law of armed conflict. So uh, we are also, one thing that we are doing is creating a new annual report to Congress that members have requested. This is in request uh, because of interest of transparency. So this is in line with conversations that we have with, with the congressional members as we try to uh, really uh, you know, uh, work together in a way uh, uh, that uh, that makes sense and moves the ball forward, but this is not new standards. Uh, this is uh, this is something. These are these are um, these are things that already exist. To your point, that is now in writing, and then there we did create a new annual report for more transparency. If Israel doesn't sign off within the deadline of 45 days, because it is in, involved with active conflict, will the U.S. aid be cut off immediately? So what I can tell you is that uh, we did brief the Israelis on this. Uh, they reiterated their willingness to provide these types of assurances. So those conversations are happening, and, and they uh, obviously they reiterated their willingness uh, to, for these assurances. Thank okay. Great. Uh, One more. Okay. Thank you, Green. If the special counsel says President Biden has got significant limitations on his memory, then who is helping him run the country? The President of the United States runs the country. The Commander-in-Chief runs the country. How can he be trusted with the nuclear codes if, I, I get that you're saying that uh, nobody in the building would say that he's got an issue with his memory, but just the little part of what we get to see, he's made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake on camera this week. So I want to be very clear here. Um, the reality is that report, that part of the report, does not live in reality. It just doesn't. So the special counsel is, is it, lying it about is, the it is, it is, it was gratuitous. You heard from my, you heard from Ian Sams, my colleague. Uh, it is unacceptable, and it does not live in reality. That is just the facts. And and look, it is a closed case. That is what the special counsel said. And 
What matters is here is that the president in the last three years has delivered on the economy, has delivered on health care, has turned this country around after the last president left us with an economy that was in a tailspin. That's what we were dealing with. That's what we were dealing with. If you think about the world leaders, world leaders and issues that have been going on in this country for the past two, three years, not in this country, in the world, right? When you think about Ukraine, the president was able to bring together NATO, NATO allies. They have been the strongest than they've ever been and make sure that we are providing what Ukraine, the brave people of Ukraine need as they're fighting aggression, uh, Putin's aggression. And that is what this president has, has been able to do. His, his experience as former senator, as former vice president, and now president, has gotten us to a place where we've been able to turn things around in a way that we meet the needs of the American people, whether it's domestic issues or national security issues. And that is uh, what matters. That part of the report does not live in reality. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Let me reach out to the president's doctor.